Hello friends, this is Shubha Lakshmi and today I'm going to tell you about my journey of making the book The Field Guide of Indian Moths. It appears to be a very small book but a good amount of time and effort has gone in making this. So let's take a tour to this journey. So my journey started with my guide Mr. Naresh Chaturvedi who was then the curator of BNHS. I joined BNHS newly and um, this is one in 1993 and that's when I learned that he had become a guide and he could take students for MSc and PhD. In fact, I was his first student and I, when I went and met him and I told him that I was interested uh, in doing MSc under him and my favorite topic then was butterflies. You know, it's, it's so easy to get um, infatuated with butterflies especially if you meet a person like Isaac Kehimka so he's like he t he makes you fall in love with butterflies so that's what I that's what it did to me as well but when I met Mr. Narit Chaturvedi he told me not to pursue butterflies but to pursue moths and that time I had no clue about moths you know it was my um in fact, 1993 is what I started my journey in the field of natural history. So I had no clue about moths, but I trusted him and I said, okay, let's give a try to it. And he gave me one message. He said that uh, you need to follow a path which has been not taken by many. And moths is such a path because th that time not many were studying moths. And if I remember, probably I was a I was the first female to study moths. I'm not really sure, but I think so. So that's how my journey started. Ideally, I should have um, stopped after I did my PhD because it started with MSc and then with MSc I did my, then after I continued for PhD or as well. And uh, that time I was only studying two families of moths, uh, which is, um, Hawk moths and emperor moths and Mr. Chaturvedi was um, very particular about that what like how focused I should be and he he used to tell me that I shouldn't be looking out for other moth caterpillars or other moths while I'm in field I should only look for you know hawk moths and emperor moths so during my masters I was studying the life histories of hawk moths and emperor moths and uh, thereafter for my PhD I started looking at um, population dynamics of adult moths and that's when I started setting up light light sheets like this one uh, and started studying them and um, even at that time if I remember um, not much was known about moths or this technique was not really uh, very popular among people and um, in initially myself and Mr. Chaturvedi we did a, a quite odd experiments with the light sheets till we figured out that this is the best way to study moths. So light sheet uh, is um, an adaptation of light trap where moths are actually not killed when they come, when they get attracted to this light sheet. And it is a plain white cloth and there's a mercury lamp that attracts the moths. And moths, once they settle, then one can photograph them, observe them, study them. It becomes a rather very easy thing to study. Uh, but only problem is that you have to remain awake in the night to study them. So coming back, so I finished my PhD in 2003. So that's, that's uh, by the time people were actually uh, knowing me or rather giving me names like moth lady and bug lady, because this was also the time I started, like in, in 2000, I started myself and my guide, Mr. Narish Chaturvedi, uh, started the course on entomology. It was like first of its kind course in in India and we started with the correspondence course and that's where the popularity about insects also began and I got this title of moth lady or bug lady. A uh, moth lady I, I remember um, there was one BNHS member Leon Lobo uh, BNHS and I was working at the BNHS Conservation Education Center which is in Goregaon so every Sunday morning BNHS members used to visit that BNHS reserve to do bird watching or to do nature study and I was the one who used to spend a previous night at the center because I used to go to the national park to study moths and I used to come back 
and stay put in the center. And in the morning, I was the one who used to return. And while I'm returning, I, I could see these BNHS members walking into the reserve and they always encountered me. And that's how I got the name. There goes the moth lady, you know. So mm -hmm. I'm really thankful that he gave me that name. So this responsibility was um, made me to to pursue moths beyond my PhD. Uh, because uh, though I was only studying hawk moths or emperor moths, but invariably people used to bring bring up pictures of every moth and expected me to identify it. And I used to tell them, look, I don't know these moths. I can only identify a hawk moth or an emperor moth. And later on I felt that probably I should not give these kind of naive answers to people. Probably I should really start looking into the moths. And that's where I started exploring moths and started in 2004. When I decided that now I should explore moths from other families, I also decided that now I'm not going to study alone or not going to explore alone. And that was the time when I wanted some help and I, was, I started looking up for volunteers. Among my course participants who were undergoing the entomology course, uh, I floated the idea of um, anyone trying to help me with my mothing expeditions and uh, i promise that whoever helps whoever helps me or joins in my expedition i would um, make them co-author in my paper which i which i eventually bring out that time i got these three lovely ladies uh, alka vaidya neeli makalgi alka bhagwat uh, they were the regulars at uh, BNHS Nature Reserve and they were probably very excited about this idea. They were also clueless, just like I was when I started my uh, mothing studies. So I trained them, I uh, took their help. They were a very big help for me because um, when you set up light sheets and you're studying moths, it becomes a very lonely exercise and sometimes it's it's also becomes it also becomes boring so you always need a company or you can always enjoy a company or enjoy some coffee with someone while looking at moths and these ladies actually give me that company they give me the comfort of doing research not only in the field and even um, like to some extent initially in the initial months we started collecting specimens and uh, we were, they were helping me in setting the specimens, mounting them, labeling them. We did all those exercises together and um, it was a very fun field exercise for us. And that's the time we started looking at a variety of information which was actually missing uh, for moths, uh, basically ecological data. So um, we wanted to study the distribution aspect of it, the breeding biology. In the night time, we used to set up the light sheets and then and during the daytime, we used to water in the forest and collect the caterpillars and rear them. So breeding biology information, habitat preferences, and also the behavior. We started recording all this. And most importantly, we started photographing the moths because um, most of the photographs which you see today in my book is actually a compilation of photographs taken in all these years and uh, though we started in 2004 but it was somewhere in 2009 9 or 10 we actually published our findings and all these three were my co-authors and I'm really happy to say that after after the research work with me um, Alka with they continues to do more thing in various parts of the country Alka Bhagwat pursued her PhD of course, in butterflies, and today she does. Uh, uh, she teaches courses in butterfly gardening. So somewhere, this uh, exercise of studying moths triggered uh, something very positive in these ladies, and they have uh, started pursuing. And even Nirima Kalki is associated with uh, one of the NGOs ferns uh, in Thane, where where um, environmental or nature related programs have been conducted. I'm really thankful to these ladies. So the information that we were looking at, um, so that was the information I wanted to add in the book. And if you look into the book, we have used these kind of symbols. The symbols where a habitat has been mentioned, uh, whether a moth is a day flying or night flying, uh, whether it comes to light or whether it doesn't, because uh, you might be surprised that there are many moths which don't visit lights and there are many moths um, which are day flying 
and yet come to the light and there are some which are night flying and don't come to the light so you know so i thought that we need to differentiate these differences among the species so these symbols wherever present or absent actually they communicate uh, that particular feature and even uh, while uh, it's it was difficult for me to you know, put a time a flight period because uh, what i record as a flight period in maharashtra may not be applicable something in northeast so and also there is not enough data to even come up with a spectrum of like the range of the months like from the starting month and the ending month because we need that kind of information so what i have done is that i have just put indicative months that where in which month the moth was sighted and probably uh, for a reader it is it is an indicative month so few uh, two three months before the month which is mentioned there and after is applicable for the moths that the moths will be on the wing i have also i uh, put symbol for sexual dimorphism where male and female species are uh, sub, uh, are different looking um, caterpillars or moth species which are pest um, or which are affecting the agriculture negatively they have been also marked i have deliberately avoided the term pest because you know it's it's ecologically it's not correct and a large number of moth species don't feed at all um proboscis is completely absent and that's the reason there is one symbol of uh, proboscis uh, being absent so we collected this kind of uh, i've been collecting rather this kind of information for all i would say for last 15 years this exercise has been going on and why mothing uh, can be very exciting exercise but imagine if you have to spend night in a forest like this and especially for women uh, there are more limitations because i still remember that uh, uh, when i used to go to uh, the forest department officials for permission they used to always tell me that why am i uh, oh, like why i have chosen this difficult topic where i need to go uh, deep in a forest in the night time and set up the slide sheet and study them uh, they used to tell me that why don't you pursue something daytime species something like butterflies it doesn't suit you you know <laughs> this these were the comments i used to get so mothing uh, is actually very exciting activity and we use and the best time to do mothing is new moon nights so you can imagine dark nights going out in the forest it can be very very scary so during my phd time i was like i was like with my uh, driver and my field assistant so we three people used to be there right in the forest uh, till midnight maybe or not midnight past midnight maybe around till 1 or 2 o'clock we used to sit next to the light lamp sometimes we used to get scared if a leopard may pass by from there or any other, any other wild animal but um yeah those are the I, i think for every researcher these kind of challenges are there and um the one thing about mothing is that it is very very addictive because it's so much of so much of thrill is there and um, um uh challenges are also there which keeps you on toes all the time especially uh, logistic nightmare is like common very very common uh having a spare bulb is always important if you're going uh, for mothing in remote areas so having a spare bulb because any time your bulb may fall off or break it could be windy and uh, um Um, power supply is always a challenge uh, most of the places don't have power supply so generator is needed and generators are so heavy actually so you need a vehicle to carry it or if it is a remote area such as in arunachal pradesh you know where you need to hire a porter or you have to put it on a yard to carry the um, a generator to the top so those kind of challenges i think these kind of logistic challenges make makes mothing a very expensive research technique um but technically for moths it's not a good technique because uh, now uh, when you are actually setting up the light you are actually disrupting the moth's regular routine a moth which was supposed to go and find a mate got distracted to your light a moth some was supposed to go and feed and got distracted and landed up in the light skin and they remain there till the light is there so it is like a disruptive uh, method but there is no other best method of studying moths and at least here we don't kill moths we are very selective in studying them we take photographs and um, otherwise the light traps 
usually are attached to a killing jar and moths are killed in wholesale you know so this is a difficult task uh, but um, still the better um, better was better than killing the moths and we used to adopt some some techniques where I, we ensure that the disturbance is uh, minimum or the damage is minimum. So we used to set up the light trap after the sunset and we used to switch off the light trap, light sheet before the sunrise, which also means that we, we used to wake up um, in the morning by five o'clock just to check the light sheets and then switch it off and again go back to sleep. So this is, this is the... There's a discipline we have been following just to ensure that moths don't become sitting ducks in the morning for the birds who can relish them for breakfast. So, mothing can can be very very irritating activity also, uh, especially uh, you know if you go to like this was in Bhutan where i was uh, literally swarmed by moths to such an extent that i had to really cover myself i didn't do it in any other locations um, in india but in bhutan that was a scene and you get moths of all sizes they are all over your body crawling so it can't be very comfortable and sometimes it becomes very confusing also on what to photograph and what not to photograph and a situation like this we have to like i remember this light sheet i had to switch it off because i was not able to take photograph and the amount of moths which were carpeting the ground were not allowing me to go closer to the light sheet so i had no choice but to um, switch off because i was not able to do anything and i was really overwhelmed when i saw this kind of uh, response uh, so yeah <laughs> different places have different uh, challenges but the rewards are amazing uh, when you see a light sheet filled of moths of this variety it's, it's mind-boggling mind-boggling i would say and this is the reward we get for all the effort we put in setting up the light sheet um, but we don't get this kind of light sheet every time, everywhere, you know. It just varies from place to place. And um, best seasons for mothing is actually from monsoon to post-monsoon. These are the best months. Sometimes just few, uh, just a month before summer is also a good time. And that's the reason doing selective mothing can give you good amount of uh, data in a very short time. But of course, during my research years, I had to do mothing throughout the year just to uh, get no data. You know, no data is also data. So to tell, to mention that um, in particular months, moths are not seen, I need to be there to see that they are not seen. You know, so that's how uh, it becomes a tedious process of being uh, sitting next to the light sheet when you know no one, no one is going to visit the light sheet. You know, yet you have to collect that data. Unfortunately, over the years, I've become smarter. I no more do that. I just identify the right time and just I just be at the right situation, in the right place. Uh, most of them, uh, like like. Like any other uh, biodiversity or any other uh, taxa, uh, moths are also found in any good habitat. The better habitat you have, better diversity is there. Of course, moths are used now uh, to study uh, habitat, uh, like uh, different types of habitat, disturbed habitat or pristine habitat, undisturbed habitat. So moths are used as an indicator species uh, now. And there is a very interesting study uh, which not much has been done in India. And I, and I want to really take it up uh, um, now of studying the moth assemblages in different habitats to study that which all families are representing in which kind of habitat. And that's something a very interesting study if anybody wants to really pursue moths. That's a way to go of uh, studying moths in comparison with, with its immediate uh, habitat. Yes, I just can't take off my eyes from the screen. It is just uh, so full of diversity and I'm while I'm talking, I'm still trying to figure out, did I miss out some moth which is not in my book? <laughs> well, I have, I have several moths, unidentified moths lying in my computer. And this is a very normal thing. Okay. It's very normal that uh, you'll find a new species in moths. Uh, you'll find a range extension in moths. And that 
several of them remain unidentified it's a common thing okay it's nothing brilliant i remember still i still remember uh, some people coming to me saying that oh i got a very rare moth and it can't be identified i said so what <laughs> there are many others which can't be identified so it's very common for more for moths uh, to remain unidentified and that's where the uh, main challenge as we go further i'm going to explain that what kind of challenges i underwent in identifying moths I don't think moths is challenging because the way moths look in the field, uh, it's not very easy to identify the way they look in the field. Uh, say this moth, the crimson underwing. It usually sits in this style where the hind wings are usually closed. So the color of the hind wing is indicative factor in many of the moth species. So how do you get this color? How you get to capture this color? So what I used to do, I used to slightly nudge the moth over here. And this is as a difference, it used to open up. The, and it just opens up very fraction, for a very fraction of second. And then if you're able to capture that moment, you get this picture and you know, okay, the hind wing is crimson in color with a black patch. Okay, but sometimes it's not only this hind wing color, it is an underside color also it matter. Now look at this moth, it is actually very dull and drab on the top, but look at the underside of the color, it is yellow and the black spots. So underside colors are also important. So that, that's the reason that moths are actually collected. You can't easily identify them on photographs alone. They need to be collected, they need to be dissected or they need to be mounted to get the correct identification. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about some books which I have been referring for my work and uh, some of the challenges which I have faced in using these books. Uh, now, I consider this book, uh, The Fawn of British India, um, which, is a, which is like um, Fawn of British India. Like British wrote a good amount of books on Indian wildlife. Uh, flora and fauna rather. So it comes under this series of Fauna of British India and PNHS Library has a good, uh, all this series in the library. So there is a five volume which is written about moths and you can see the time frame. It is written in 1892 to 1937. So this is the time frame when the moths, these books were written and I still uh, feel they are really um, uh, good books. Uh, the only problem is that the classification has been changed, the genus name has been changed, the species name has changed, everything has changed, okay? But what is really standard is that the description, what they have mentioned over there, the distribution range. In fact, the distribution range is also changed because the countries have so many, like the countries have changed, location names have changed. What is old Bombay is no more Bombay today, okay, right? So, so the old Bombay was Gujarat, including Gujarat, some aspect of Karnataka. So, so those descriptions, but of course you can always find um, like Naga Hills is actually Arunachal Pradesh. Arunachal Pradesh was not mentioned in this book, but so so the distribution range has also changed, but still the information remains uh, accurate and um, they have just a few pictures like this, like this black and white pictures and descriptions. So many a times I had the challenge of uh, identifying moths and collecting the information because the species name would um, the species if the species so i used to look up for a moth species so i start with the genus name if i don't find the genus name then i look up for the species name and if i don't find the species name as well then i um, start reading up the description of a particular family so this description has been very helpful in identifying good amount of uh, uh, species uh, for my book Another book which is um, is Moths of Thailand. It is also uh, six volumes are there. This is comparatively good book um, because it is having all color plates and one you can identify uh, the um, moths very readily. And Thailand and India has almost similar uh, moth fauna, so it's easier to relate. Uh, but only challenge here is that you will not know how this moth sits in the wild. And if you come across this moth. Uh, you won't know that this is a moth you're looking at actually because these are all set specimens. So identifying moths from the set specimens, if you don't know uh, how the moth actually looks like um, in the set specimen, 
So it's very difficult to visualize. Uh, but this is meant for people who, researchers who, who, who have been studying moths. So from one reference to other reference, you get information about it. Very expensive book, I would say. So that's why I keep saying that my book may not be that expensive because the amount of books which I have purchased and I have uh, the amount of money I have spent in buying these international books has been much higher. This is, uh, I, I really like this book, the series of this book, uh, The Moths of Borneo by J.D. Holloway because it's completely online and all the information is there. The only flip side is that uh, we don't share that kind of um, moth fauna um, in India. Uh, but what is what is good about it that the genus level, at genus level we are still, um, the species remain the same. Uh, or the genus level, or the information remains the same. So the genus level, the family level, that kind of information is very uh, useful. And uh, what uh, Holloway has also done in this book is that uh, he has uh, brought in the ecological aspect of the uh, moths, such as the life history component, the host plant, uh, and also some interesting behavior pertaining to the habitat specificity. So that was, uh, in fact, Good amount of information from these books I have taken for my uh, my species, which are mentioned in the book. It's it's completely online, and one can have a look at this. Moths of Nepal is very close to is is almost very similar to the Indian moth fauna, and it's a very good book. I couldn't buy it because it was out of stock, and it is phenomenally expensive. I would say, uh, but I was. Uh, fortunate to have some color plates of this uh, book and um, they were really good uh, in terms of uh, identification. Also, one of the challenges for is that getting the name of a moth is so important. And But when I was writing the book for me, getting the name was important. But then after the name, what I needed more information. I needed information about the ecology. I wanted to know where it is found, how big it is, the description, everything, you know. Now, getting that kind of information was a challenge. And uh, so I had to really do a good amount of R&D to find out that kind of information. And in term, and in, in places where I didn't find this information, I had to actually collect this information myself from the field. And uh, that's how the information has been fed into the book. So here is a small exercise uh, uh, I usually do if um, in identification of a mod. I hope you will enjoy this. Uh, those is, it, though it is slightly technical, but I'm just giving you a flavor of uh, what a, a, what any uh, moth researcher would be doing in identifying the moths. So I found this moth uh, in Sikkim. So this is how the moth sit, and this is how the inside color, hind wing color of the moth looks like. So I got this moth identified in as per the moths of Thailand as uh, Patchouids Harutai, right? Uh, and then that's it. I just got the name. I just got the, um, uh, the distribution was actually not matching. So when the distribution was not matching, so I said, I need to look up more to see that something similar, the Indian species should be something similar to it. So I googled it and when I googled it, I got this name uh, Dini Kods Harutai, which means that uh, Pechoid's name was changed to Dini Kods Harutai. So fair enough, you know, you get you get the updated name. But then what? You are, I wanted the more information. I wanted the ecological information. I wanted the wingspan. I wanted the exactly the distribution range. Because many times in online work, in online uh, internet sources, it's a very broad uh, range which has been given of global range is given. Whereas in for British fauna of British India, there's very specific location-wise details are given. So I started looking up uh, in fauna volume of British India, but I didn't find uh, no dinicoid harutai or no patchoid harutai, no harutai at all. So there were no records, which convinced me that the species is either not covered by fauna of British India or both the names have got changed and therefore there is no records. I'm not able to find it uh, by putting a search uh, in this document. 
I I again went back to Google and then uh, sorry I uh, then I checked so Lep Index is another site where you get to know the older names and the new names so I checked uh, over there and when I checked there I found that the Pechoids was actually the synonym of a new name that was Terpena and then Terpena so so I got the genus new name that was Terpena and then uh, Harutai I ch wanted to check it didn't show the uh, details for. India there was no details for Haritai but then later on it I, it showed that while Pachoids is a, a synonym for Terpena even Dinicoids which I assumed that it is a updated name is also synonym of Terpena so one thing was clear that Terpena was the new genus name now the challenge was to find the species name so again i go back to the british fauna of british india this time <coughs> i'm trying to look up with the name of tarpena yeah so i with tarpena i didn't find the uh, uh with, with tarpena i didn't find uh, so what what i did i started reading that particular section to which uh, tribe or which subfamily this uh, species was belonging. This was a Gemotridae family. I started reading up the descriptions and somewhere while I was reading the uh, description, I came across this species name called Himataria. Okay, Himataria. And later on I found out that, like again, going back to Lep Index, that Himataria was the synonym of Harudai. Yeah, now I got the name actually that is Tarpena uh, Hima, Himataria. So somewhere I got some link that okay, some information is there. So I got uh, the content which I was looking for. Then I still wanted to be very, I was not very clear. I was not very confident that this is the Tarpena Himataria because the species description was not completely matching. So, you know, we can't let go if it is not matching, even if it is, it's even if it is like 90% matching is in 10% is not matching yet sometimes we have to pursue though there are species where um, same species look different also but we can't really give up till we are very sure that this is a this is a diverse species where the markings can be like it's it can change it, the varies within the species so i had no idea about so therefore i i couldn't rest with it so i still pursued it and then on the google while i was looking out for tarpana himataria i came across a paper wherein they mention about tarpana crocina whose description especially the underwing color description perfectly matched with the one of with the my mom you know and then i said okay if this is the name Tarpena crossina, then I should still find the information for the right information about this. And again, I went to the fauna volume, and there, this Tarpena crossina information was available under Pseudo Tarpena crossina. And the updated name of the species is Tarpena crossina. So actually, I spent half a day to figure out this more, though I enjoyed every bit. It was more like a detective series for me. And I, I wanted to name this moth as a crocin moth because it really gave me a headache. But anyway, I didn't give it a crocin moth name because it's it's an endemic species. So I have given Indian terpena as a common name. So that's just a flavor of how uh, we moth around uh, identifying species, especially when the books are not there. So books played or references play a very important role in studying moths. And so that's the reason I have made effort in trying to compile the most popular references both print and online which is available um, currently and i have mentioned that at the end of my book so that because i don't claim that my book is going to be helpful in actually identifying every mod that you're going to come across it is i i tell that this is a starter book it is a trailer book it will just set the ball rolling to study mods uh, like maybe interest amateurs to get into mods, but if you want to really study further, then all these references would be needed because it, 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 it's impossible for anybody to put the entire moth information in one uh, publication. So you would need these kind of references.
Okay, so this is a good compilation of both men of the world, especially the men with whom I have interacted in all my research years. And I must tell you that these uh, men are, are really great human beings because they have selflessly actually helped me um, whenever I sought help from there. And so he's uh, Dr. Roger Kendrick, who has been a very long term friend of mine. Uh, and um, uh, he has um, he has, we have published a joint paper now. He did the editing of my uh, book uh, where he did the editing of the species especially. He verified that whatever identification is in put up is correct. So he's instrumental and anything is wrong. I think he's the person I'm, we all should be catching hold of. And um, Dr. Yan Kiching, he is from the Natural History Museum, very nice person, and he's a hop moth and emperor moth specialist. So very often I refer hop moths and emperor moth, any query to him. Uh, Dr. J.D. Holloway, obviously, moths of Borneo fame, uh, has been also very kind to interact with us and connect me with uh, other people who could help me with my queries. Um, Mr. H. S. Barlow, he's from Malaysia. He, his book, uh, Moths of Southeast Asia, was probably the first publication I referred. It was readily available in BNHS and good amount of information of some of the species is, is mentioned over there. And, uh, and uh, he has also written an ex exhaustive section on life histories of moths. Uh, Dr. Shane Hon Wen is a contact of, of course, Dr. Roger Kendrick. He connected me with him. And this was a, uh, this was when I, I came across this um, new moth from Madhunachal Pradesh, which is now called the uh, Apatani Glory. Uh, so when, when I got to see the picture of that um, moth, uh, it was certain that it was not a butterfly and it was a moth. And um, and nobody was able to identify. And uh, when I sent that picture to Dr. Shen Von Wen, he actually said, this is this is a zygote, but it is an undescribed species. And that prompted me to actually take an expedition in Arunachal Pradesh in search of that moth. And um, this was in some 2011, but I was not successful in getting that moth. And now I know, now we all know that that moth has been discovered and named. So yes, this is just a, um, you know, like how these people have play, played a key role in in helping. So I have traveled uh, for moths. I've been very specific in identifying, uh, in doing mothing in um, biodiversity hotspot zone because that's the best place to start with. And uh, so I started with uh, hotspots, did extensive mothing in Western Ghats and also to some extent Northeast Himalayas. So my most of my uh, pictures are from this area, but I did collect uh, info, uh, pictures from many other photographers. Uh, but if you um, actually now, when I look at this map, there's an entire uh, coast, the eastern eastern Ghat is in the central India is is completely um, is not covered, and it's also that it's it, there are not many people who are actually studying moths in these areas, and therefore there's not many records coming. So this is one of the potential areas where any mother who is planning to take up moth studies, these are the areas where one should start studying so that we have eventually, uh, you know, a good amount of data in, in maybe in, in 10 years time. And there is already a website uh, been floated by uh, Sanjay Sondi and uh, his colleagues, the Moths of India, where they are trying to document as many moths uh, and putting all information over there. So that's another good place where one can actually contribute their data. So uh, while writing this book, uh, one of the challenges which I faced was that how much information I should be giving and, and how much is more and how much is less. Um, I certainly felt that this is this being a first book, it has to be uh, at least it should at least fulfill the curiosity in the first go, uh, not that people have to refer more books to get more information. So my 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 um, my plan was to give a concise book. I deliberately made a small book so that it becomes very handy. I didn't want uh, big. I didn't want to make a big book. In fact, the content, the amount of content which sits in this book, I can easily blow it up and make a very book big book and look at very expensive but that was not my intention my intention was to give a very handy book to people and yet information in a small capsules 
tightly packed capsules provided there. So yet I had, uh, I tried to, so I have incorporated almost everything about about moths in my book, though in a very small nutshell, I have given the information and um, accommodating this information in a very small space uh, was always a challenge for me. And I and my editors, content editors have worked really hard to see that um, we did justice to whatever is there in the book. And uh, uh, not only the information, but also which species I should include and which I shouldn't. Initially, it was thought uh, I should only have some common moths. Uh, but um, you know, to, even, to, even to ascertain what is common, there has to be a data, isn't it? I didn't have that kind of data. It, things which I feel is common may not be common because I've been, I'm, I'm moving in Western Ghats and in Northeast, uh, Northeast Himalaya. Or, or, that is that will be a very biased data so so it was not really we are not looking at a common it's a fairly uh, it's a moth which you can find in most of places yet there are some rare species yet there are some endemic species which we have incorporated some very charismatic species uh, some species even i have not seen but i have incorporated in this uh, in this book in a hope that the readers might get a chance to see it so uh, there are altogether some 38 families which I have uh, incorporated in my uh, book. And um, the approach which we have taken in this book is that uh, there is a um, double spread information about the family followed by the pictorial uh, plates of and every um, pictorial. Like this is this is the uh, family section where uh, family information is in. Yet, uh, let me tell you that this family section um, I have written by referring many, many books. There is not a single book available where all this information is sitting in one place. You know? So I'm, I have really saved a good amount of your effort in reading all these books. It's all in one place. And then the spacious information has been arranged. And for first time, I would say a moth has a common name. So 773 species which are included in this book, each one of them has a common name. Right. And I have tried to be as innovative, as creative in coining these names. Right. Some are really funny names also. So you you will probably like it because the whole purpose of having a common name is also to make the moth popular. So with that intention, I have coined these names. So when you uh, when you look at the moth plates, the moth plates are actually cutouts of moths. There are actual pictures. <laughs> because most of the moth pictures uh, which I have clicked are mostly at the light shades and light shades background don't make really an interesting they don't look very aesthetic so I had to use this cutout approach which 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 actually made this book cost very higher because there's a cost for cutting out each and every image and then actually guiding the person that which is the antenna part where is the leg part and which is the body part how much is to be taken how much is not to be taken that was like yeah that we had gone forward and backward on many species like this but it is worthwhile i'm sure you will enjoy uh, when you see this um, this moth and also i've tried to keep the jargons at uh, minimum uh, in fact, most of the technical terms have been replaced with common terms and I've given, like you look at this uh, moth body, how the different parts of moth body is been given a common name. And uh, the common question which everybody has that how moths are different from butterfly. Practically, they're not at all different. Okay, they almost, almost are same, almost same. It's just that some aspect, uh, some, sometimes moths are more, some, some aspects, moths are, moths just amplify those aspects because the sheer number which is there. So even this section would be and will make an interesting read and um, uh, in terms of differences in or in terms of uh, difference, I, I would still say moths excel butterflies in many aspects, in many, in many areas of life and that's very interesting to compare. I have folk, I have emphasized in my entire book that life history is the most important part or the missing link or missing data uh, in this, um, you know, the entire jigsaw puzzle of moths. So we really want more and more people to study moths and rare them and document that information. And in fact, um, we will be pro we we are providing with data sheets and uh, uh, the protocol of uh, studying moths. Everything is also being provided. 
some aspect of uh, life history data sheets we are we are going to will be uploading on our website so people can download it and uh, use it so this this is something which everybody can contribute uh, mothing is probably a difficult task because it is as i said there are logistics requirement but reading catapult is something very simple even school students can undertake moth reading catapult reading uh, of moths and help science being an educator all my life uh, i have to bring this moth education component in my book on how one can actually popularize moths and how education could be used so there is there is a section on, on moth education and what kind of programs uh, we can do and in fact we are also going to provide more updates on different types of program modules on moth education through our website so the book uh, at the end of the book we have given a checklist of all the species which is found, which is mentioned in the book and there is a, there is a section of uh, thinking of the observations so just like um, people have bird lifers uh, we want people to start talking about moths like moth lifers so i i would it would be really nice to see for yourself that um, if you have this book and when you start looking for moths and by what time you actually cover this 773 species like how old are you by that time it will be very interesting <laughs> and um and of course more new species would get added up but it's something interesting to document that how your moth studies are going on and how many species you are able to look well writing the book was the most difficult part but as at the end of the uh, and the last stage i realized the most toughest part was actually the designing layouting editing and printing part because um, these were the things which are not in my control uh, this was in this, somebody else was doing it and i was actually at the mercy of these people who were actually working for me and uh, some of them actually caused a good amount of uh, um, difficulty for me that uh, which actually affected my book in terms of it got delayed but yes it's a learning lesson i think i have just become more smarter for my next book well it doesn't end with writing a book alone now since we are actually this was a self publishing and uh, burden publisher is my own company enterprise uh, lady bird environment consultings so we had to get the isbn we had to set up the website we had to set up the payment gateway we have to create the social media hype for prisons and uh, we also started with the pre publication offer and now the book is out and we have to continue doing this because uh, moths is not a hot topic moths is not something that everyone will come running and you know go after it you know so it, we have to generate interest and that's something which i have to do in creating awareness about moths and i'm just waiting for the more rains to come that's when the more the moth drama actually starts and i think i'll be able to engage more audience uh, through my programs or my initiatives in creating awareness about moths i have been not an entomologist uh, by profession it is my passion uh, i have been entomologist so i uh, when i was working for bnhs i was an education i was an educationist you know so um, in my spare time i was actually studying moths and after i left bnhs and i started my own company the lady bird environment consulting and then after i started my own ngo that is i nature watch foundation uh, among this somewhere the book was actually take in the back seat and therefore the delay was there and it is always a challenge uh, for any individual to manage all these entities and while continuing with the passion so um that is just to justify the delay that my book has uh, caught you know why my book has been delayed for so many years and i i'm sure that my next book um, i hope to write more books on more volumes on moths but my next book and planning to write on insects so it should not take this long uh, i have learned my lessons so uh, i would end my presentation with the six people who actually made me for what i am today without their encouragement without their support without their 
upbringing i wouldn't be what i am because uh, studying maths needed more of a uh, persuasive persuasion of uh, chasing them or to being determined on what you want to do these are the some traits which i have learned or i have picked up from my seniors and uh, two people from my family my mother and my brother who are no more today uh, have played a very important role in my life my mother especially she has been an insect phobic all her life and she also made me insect phobic but um, that got changed when i joined bnhs and we used to joke many times because i used to scare her with my caterpillars i used to take the caterpillars and is just release on her uh, palms and she used to just scream and she used to tell me i wonder how come you are my daughter and i used to say the same to her i said i too wonder how come you are my mother because i just love insects and you hate and my brother who ensured that i get education because he was very uh, particular that i should uh, get good good education in spite of all the hardships so he i think uh, i owe all my success to him and in my professional life uh, this four gentlemen played a very crucial role uh, isaac kemkar my partner and mentor right from the start of my day day one in bnhs he continues to mentor me my guide narish chitradi who is no more but uh, i will never forget him because he was a man who brought me or introduced me to the mods and then my first good boss uh, arvind karandikar uh, he taught me a uh, good lessons about being professional of of work work culture of being uh, doing the right job doing the good job this is this is the why values which i picked up until today uh, he i keep going back to him and he still helps me and i think he was a best boss best boss in terms because i previous to bnhs i had met all worst bosses and he was a, such a pleasant surprise uh, to work with and um, and yes ma dr asad rehmani my last good boss i call him uh, because he uh, my career actually was fast tracked uh, the moment he became the director he has been a great supporter of my work uh, while uh, i was in bnhs he gave me freedom to do whatever i want and uh, he trusted me and that was very important for me and even today he guides me and helps me and uh, we sometimes work together so it is really great to be surrounded by people like uh, you know by our guides and mentors and i think uh, everybody should really look up uh, for such guides and mentors and if you find them uh, ensure that you are in touch with them and don't let them go because they they are the they are the people who have seen best in you and they are the people who have seen the potential in you and nobody else can actually tell you that um, how great you could be because sometimes you doubt our uh, your own abilities and it's only your guides and the mentors are the ones who can see that in you you know so i i am a great believer of mentors and guides and i can say the same for the younger generation to look up for a guide a coach you know yes so that's it that was my journey and the book is out and um, when the book is out i feel so empty now actually i feel uh, uh, a mission is over and i'm really looking for next mission i can't really sit idle for very long time so my next mission either is to write my second volume on um, indian moths or um, i start writing a new book on indian insects thank you friends